Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Max Parthas. You are here for the Abolish Slavery National Network Anniversary Celebration 2022. We're going to start this off with some fire right off the bat. I want to introduce you to one half of Maximum Impact Poetry. Uh, she is a world-renowned spoken word artist, multi-published, multi-recorded uh, artist, as well as the uh, other half of my life, my wife, Tribal Ring. Give it up for Tribal Ring. Aggressor. See, being hunted is never going to turn out well for the prey. Having to eke out a plan of survival while continuously looking over your shoulder, wondering what, or should I say who, will be snatched up next. How many will they hurt or kill? Come on, folks, we all know the drill. We all grew up in the valley in the shadow of truth. How many pints of blood will they exact for our imagined sin? It's as if being born black were an option and our preconscious opinions held sway. When only the Almighty had an opinion that day, so suck it up, buttercup. We were born this way. And for most of us, the secret to dealing with the oppression is to deny its existence, as if we can afford the luxury of entertaining conscious distance, deliberately looking away as our people are being decimated by genocide desiccated by pride, when the sad fact of the matter is most of us are unwilling witnesses dragged along for a ride, pulling out our cameras and recorders in order to chronicle the view, sheepishly bowing our heads when asked, well, what did you do to assist in the struggle? To which most of us can only reply that we're out here trying to make a living. Hell, we're trying not to die. See, truth happens when you look into the actual faces of the oppressed and the oppressor. You can't hide or deny what you see. One must always be the lesser. When you look in the mirror, are you facing the truth? Are you, are you existing in their lives? Whose face would I see but are, were I to look in your eyes? See, the sad fact of the matter is, if you're not going to stand up and act, then get out of the way. And let those of us who are consciously aware that slavery is still here and that the overseers are still hunting in America's hunting grounds stand up and fight. Not just for our rights, but for your rights too. Even though you're doing all you can do to label us troublemakers, rabble rousers, thieves, too ignorant and blind to realize that they're hunting you too. See, any brown or black meat will do as a serving at the master's table. Well, he'll dine on the flesh of the ignorant oppressed just as lustily as he sucks the marrow from the bones of the conscious food. Come on, get a clue. See, in their eyes, black don't matter unless it pertains to slavery or servitude. How much money are you worth in their pockets? What role will you play in their prison industrial courts? The I won't go down without a fight victim or a willing cohort. Make a conscientious choice. Because at the end of the day, it all comes down to this. Truth happens when you look into the actual faces of the oppressed and the oppressor. You can't hide or deny what you see. And right here on the American plantation, they're still hunting folks like me. And now that you know, what are you going to do? Stop. Okay. Peace. Yeah. 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 That's what I'm talking about, right? I'm about to move this down just a little bit here as we get into our panels. All right. All right. That's good. Okay, I want to start by introducing, first of all, our lead organizer for the last two years from the very start of this movement, Brother Kamal Allen. <laughs> he is uh, one of the people who was involved in 
removing the slavery exception clause from the Colorado State Constitution, which started all of this movement uh, to begin. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, come on out. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh man, we're gonna try that one more time. I know y'all's mouth is full of food. I said good afternoon. Good afternoon. There we go. I need to feel the energy in the room, you see, because this movement is filled with energy. So much energy. First of all, I want to acknowledge um, that we are guests in Vermont as the Abolish Slavery National Network. So I just want everybody to give a hand to the, uh, all the wonderful organizers in Vermont that helped to make this trip uh, possible. And even though we are guests in this state, I want to affirm that borders are not real and that we are community from, uh, from just a couple more miles away. So thank you for inviting us back home over here. Um, we are gathering on this day, on August 28th. Does anybody here know the historic significance of August 28th? Black August. Black August, mm -hmm. yes. August 28th is one of the most historic days for black uh, people living here in the United States. That this is the day that Emmett Till was lynched by a mob of white men. This is the day that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and other civil rights organizers led a march on Washington. This is the day that Hurricane Katrina made landfall. This is the day that Senator, at the time Senator Barack Obama accepted the nomination for president. And this is the day that we raise hell today as an organization. You see, I'm an abolitionist. I am a slavery abolitionist. I, I am the descendant of the uh, women and men who have uh, survived the unspeakable. Mm. And I'm the descendant of the women and men who did not. Mm. As a descendant of those women and men, as a family member who has uh, seen loved ones go in and out of prison, I grew up with an obligation to fight against the system. I know many of us here have grown up with very similar obligations. Some of my own colleagues here have family members still locked up. Many of my colleagues here know what it's like to take blow after blow after blow with very little to no hope for seeing those loved ones or beating the system. That there were so many moments in our lives individually where we felt that the system is crushing our necks. And because of that, because we've suffered uh, individually, it, it feels incredible to, to be here together and to feel the power that we actually do have. Yes. You see, that's why we're here. Power, this, this ASNN, the Abolish Slavery National Network, started off as an idea. And I can't take credit for that. It was an idea that started among many of the other uh, organizers, both here and those who are not present right now. But what began as an idea blossomed into a movement. Back in 2018, uh, myself and, and Nathan uh, helped to lead the, um, uh, a very similar campaign uh, as the one of, um, uh, that you're leading here in Vermont into victory in Colorado. It was, the, it was the second attempt to abolish slavery in Colorado because it failed the first time. But we knew that we needed to be tenacious, that this is not an issue worth giving up. So we decided to do it again. And when we did, we quickly found out that we're not alone, that there were organizers across the nation who were already in, uh, in the process of doing something very similar, something very magical happened. That there were organizers in New Jersey, in Nebraska, in Utah, in South Carolina, in Texas, in California, 
that were wanting to do exactly the same thing. So we had a mission. We said, we're going to get everybody here on one phone call and see what happens. Because some of us had interactions outside of this. I actually remember being invited into Dennis Fibo's home, where he, uh, in New Jersey, had this incredible abolition summit that, uh, that took place with um, all, the, all the most amazing abolitionists you can meet, uh, artists. It was, it was actually one of the most incredible things I'd ever seen. And the moment I knew that Dennis was going to be a lifelong friend and colleague was when he let me crash on his couch and I was his vibe, like I was a family member, <laughs> eating up all his food and everything. <laughs> Wearing his robes. Well, you know what? <laughs> but that's how I knew that we were going we were going to be family for life. And that's what ASNN is. It's, it's family. This is abolition family. And so when we got everybody on the call at the same time, it was, it was a bit of an experiment. Let's see what happens. All right? at the, this was the year 2020. At the time, uh, Nebraska and Utah were, um, were about to put something on the ballot um, uh, for, for that year. As a matter of fact, it was on the ballot for that year. And um, many other states were about to do the same thing. And so almost instantly, it was like, like chemistry just, just clicked. And we were sharing ideas and theories and, and power and, once again, energy. And what became of that is what grew from an idea to a national movement. The Abolish Slavery National Network gives me hope. It gives me hope that we will one day live in a society where slavery is no longer acceptable for any reason, for anybody. And shout out to Martin. Shout out to Martin. Um, it has been an honor to serve these past two years as lead organizer. We're not very much into titles here in this organization because really this work is about the network. This work is about y'all. Everything that uh, ASNN believes in is possible because of the work that you all are doing right where you are and together. Um, but I, uh, I will be transitioning out of um, this position in ASNM. Um, I'll be going to law school. Um, thank you. I, law school. Wow. I have, um, uh, I, I will be one of the uh, lawyers litigating cases based on these amendment changes. So I will still be in ASNM. But the, the person that uh, will be carrying this, this through as lead organizer sitting right next to us is Savannah Aldridge. One of the most fearsome, one of the most fearsome and capable leaders I've ever met. Amen. She is incredible and she's going to serve this, or she's already served this organization well. And she's going to continue to do so. So I'm going to. Don't trade on me. So before I, um, before I pass this off to the rest of the panel, I want everybody to stand up. <laughs> yes, I want everybody to stand up. I want you to put your fist in the air. And I want you to repeat after me. I am, I am a freedom fighter. A freedom fighter. I am, I am a revolutionary. A revolutionary. I am, I am an abolitionist. An abolitionist. I am, I am an abolitionist. An abolitionist. I am, I am an abolitionist. An abolitionist. There we go. Thank you. Woo! Woo! So next up, we are going to hear from our first panel, um, the uh, the members of our administration team, and then after that, you're going to hear. Um, uh, the, the second panel, including the, the members leading um, uh, leading active campaigns for this November, including um, um, uh, Tennessee. Tennessee, I'm sorry, Tennessee, Nebraska, no, um, Louisiana, Tennessee, Tennessee, Louisiana, Alabama, Alabama and, Vermont. <laughs> and Vermont. But we and also have more Oregon, 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 and as well as a member of our federal campaign. As well. Oh wow! So. Give yourselves a round of applause. We're going to transition now. All right. Um, yeah, let me use that. Well, I just wanted to let you know who we have up here. I'm starting from 
uh, on my left, Brother Dennis Febo. Dennis Febo is the guy that thought of this whole idea in the very beginning. Uh, it came, and he'll probably tell you about it, but it started in the Hudson County Correctional Facilities with the kids there and an idea that they had and some promise that he made. So Dennis Febo on the, my left here, right next to me is Melina Cohen. Melina Cohen out of Nebraska. Uh, she uh, literally ran a campaign nearly by herself and managed to abolish slavery in Nebraska as almost like a superwoman, a one woman took out two. It was amazing, you know, she had us and she had some other people, but mainly it was her getting it all done. So if she can do it and you're watching right now in a state and you think you can do it, yes, you can do it too. Um, and then of course we have Kamal on my right and right next to him is Brother uh, Nathan. Uh, Nathan is one of the organizers from the original Colorado campaign as he's mentioned before. And next to him is Savannah. Savannah Eldridge will be in the future coming up starting now, as a matter of fact, our lead organizer. So I want to start uh, passing the mic over to Brother Dennis Febo. Uh, Dennis, can you tell us um, when you came up with this idea of all these different people that were working on this project coming together to uh, create an institution, what, what was it you were hoping would happen? Peace, fam. So when I started the, the work in New Jersey, I started at Hudson County Correctional Facility. I had shown the documentary, The 13th, um, and kind of writing on with Frederick Douglass' story that once you learn something about your condition and your status, then you would want to do something about it. So that was my goal with showing the movie kind of just leading into. And for me at that point, for all the work that I had already done to assist people, I knew that I had a block. There's nothing I could keep doing to guarantee that when our people would come home, they weren't gonna go back in. Knowing the recidivism rate in this country, knowing it in my county and in my state, New Jersey, having the highest disproportion racially in the entire country, I was just kind of fed up and looking for a way uh, to get around it. So understanding that maybe if we attacked it at the root, 13th Amendment, at the time, some of the legislators had commented they liked the work we were doing, and I. Uh, suggested and proposed, and that's how we got the New Jersey movement going. I didn't know Colorado had a movement. I didn't know that. So one day I got up from bed and I was on Facebook and I saw Colorado and Slay. I was like, what? Like, I just flipped. You know, I started calling them in a fraternity and I know we have brothers in Colorado, so I called them and they got me Abolish Slavery Colorado and I called Kamor and I was like, I, I just wanted to see them. I just wanted to see human beings who put their minds to something as big as, as so many other people, professionals, legislators, uh, leaders of movements that tell me that this was impossible. Right? That's what I kept being told over and over when I started it. When I met them, just regular ass people came together and made it happen. And I wanted that to, I, wanted, I, be, I went with the intent to record, which I did, I still have the footage, um, and to release it during the event. But Kamal blessed and came through and surprised and said, you know, I'm coming to represent Colorado. So I was like, all right, we don't got to show the movie. He's standing right here so that everybody can see. So knowing that Nebraska was reaching out, Utah, and we know anyone that does any organizing, if you try to hit it from just one angle, you're not going to be able to get it done. But when you start showing from as many different angles as possible, we figured if as many different states stood up and started their own state-based campaign, we would be able to launch at the federal level, trying to get it from the federal on the way down. We knew that that was gonna to be too much of an uphill battle. So it was a state-based movement. It became easier that way, even though for New Jersey it wasn't because we lost out just like Louisiana did. We got blocked in New Jersey. But I don't feel defeated because I've seen everything else that has come out of it. And we, I'm going to the death. I'm gonna be here to my last breath uh, doing this work. But that's how kind of everything started. Thank you, Dennis. Dennis Fibo. And next to him, uh, Melina, my question for you is, uh, Superwoman, <laughs> what was your favorite highs and lows of doing this work and ending slavery, constitutional slavery, in the state of Nebraska? Well, I think certainly meeting you all and being a small part of this 
was a high point. Um, also, election day 2020, when we won with a super majority. Super majority. That was a big one. Um, I think a low point was that I was alone for a lot of this. And so there were moments that felt kind of defeating. But I did always have um, the folks up here to turn to. Um, in particular, turning to the Colorado organizers was a big help because I had worked on campaigns before, but I'd never run one, and I just wasn't sure, like, what is the most effective messaging? And we didn't have money or resources to do, like, messaging polling. Um, so just learning from Kamau and Nathan and others in Colorado what hadn't worked at first and then what did ultimately work, that was helpful in some, in some low moments. Yes. Thank you very much, um, Melina. I appreciate that. Uh, I guess I'll tell a little bit about myself. Um, I've been involved in slavery abolition now for about 15 years. Ever since I heard Angela Davis, as you heard in the documentary, those that watched it earlier, when she said we need a 21st century abolitionist movement, that was my click moment. I was like, okay, I get it now, I understand. And so we did, a, a, I worked with a brother named Scotty Reed for about seven years on a program called New Abolitionist Radio. And we did a lot of study, a lot of research, and we report on these things and really build and educate people for seven years. And then for the following three years after that, we did our own program called Abolition Today with Brother Yusuf Hassan, and where we continued to educate and inspire. And along the way, a lot of people started hearing about this through the efforts that we were making to bring this to light. And I'd like to think that it influenced all of the campaigns to some degree, and all of the people that were thinking about this, that whether directly or indirectly, they heard it. But when we formed up, we was like, okay, who's gonna run the state campaigns? We need a state campaign guy. And it was like me and Dennis like, we'll do it. <laughs> Why not? We'll do it. We'll do it. And we started reaching out to the different states like Maine. And uh, uh, I reached out to Vermont, who was already in process of doing their thing and many others. And we told them what we were trying to accomplish and everybody was uh, on board with it. And here we are today now with the Freedom Five, which is five states that are on the ballot in 2022 where people can decide as a voter, as a citizen, that you don't want slavery in your constitution to be legal. It's just you don't, you don't want it. We also have uh, three states behind us, and with Rhode Island, which did it in 1854, I believe, that makes a total of four states. When we win these five, when we win these five, we are gonna have nine states that have abolished slavery in the United States. And in 2023, we have two dozen that are gonna follow suit they're ready to go. Florida's already got their legislation. Nevada's already been through committee. All they got to do is now is get to 23 and vote on it. So there's other states already in the process of getting this done. The whole goal as state campaign managers was to get uh, the grassroots organizations ready, get the politicians ready, the legislators ready, because in order to change the 13th Amendment, you need three quarters of the representatives on board. So we figured we would do that going state to state, working directly with these legislators. So when we say it's time, we would make that happen. And we also introduced a joint federal resolution uh, in 20, first we did it in 2020, but we did it again in 2021 on Juneteenth. Uh, it was introduced by Senator Merkley of Oregon and Congresswoman Nakima Williams of Georgia. They introduced the Abolition Amendment, which would uh, repeal the 13th Amendment and replace it with a potential 28th Amendment that had no exceptions whatsoever for slavery, including as a punishment for a crime, and to finally end slavery once and for all, all across America. So that was the role that I ended up playing and falling into. Uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing these victories happen here in Vermont, in Oregon, who is unable to attend today, but shout out to our people in Oregon. They are doing great. As a matter of fact, Oregon is doing so good that right now the number one topic that people want to vote about with the polls that they did is this very issue right here, ending slavery in Oregon. It's even higher than universal health care to them, where it should be, right? <laughs> yeah, that's pretty awesome. So shout out to our people in Oregon, Oasis. All right, so 
Uh, I don't want to talk too much. I want to give everybody a chance to say a few things along the way. So what I'm going to do is go ahead over to Brother Nathan. Nathan, you were one of the original OGs in Colorado, and you were there for the first attempt. Oh, yeah. And Yes, OG, <laughs> you were there for the first attempt. One of the things that people don't know about this movement is we lose more than we win. You see these epic victories, and they are truly epic. It never happened before, but we had to go through hell and high water to get there. Uh, we've lost 16 times since this effort has begun, not with the ASNM uh, in general, but overall since 2014. But we still managed to abolish slavery in three states, and we got five more on the list. So you felt that pain. Uh, tell us a little bit about that and the determination that Kamal uh, mentioned. The, yeah, good this working. Um, I, I have to say that in terms of uh, what brought me into this work in the first place, I know that I'm descended from slaveholders. I know that I'm descended from people who work for abolition. I know from the work that I was doing in Colorado, I learned a lot about criminal justice, the so-called criminal justice system there, and, and what didn't work in it, and the, the suffering that it caused. And when you learn, you can't unlearn that. And when I learned about the 13th Amendment and the exception and what its impact was, you can't unlearn that. And when I had a good friend, uh, Jamoki Emery, through the Black Lives Matter movement, who said, you know, we need to just repeal this exception clause in Colorado. And even in that group, the response was, oh, that's never going to happen. But it did. Right. It, it took some time. In 2016, it was on the ballot as Amendment T. And um, we, did, we didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> we were just trying to get it passed uh, with no polling data, very little money, um, just and, and no precedent that had happened. It, no other state had, had put that on the ballot and removed slavery that way. Um, but it, it did happen. And um, when the election occurred, um, it was a very, very close election. Um, 2016, that was a rough year anyway, but that was uh, was one of the roughest parts for me, was realizing that that effort just barely uh, failed it, uh, by a fraction of a percent. And part of it was, you know, we there, there were ways we could have had a stronger coalition. There, uh, the language was a real problem. They called the amendment uh, in the exception to involuntary servitude prohibition and parse that out and try to see if you know what that <laughs> Mean. That was the problem, and so we learned some things from that. And it, when we uh, went back and did it again in 2018, and that time come out was the lead organizer for that through Together Colorado, um, and it was wonderful to work with him. And we built a stronger coalition. And the name of the amendment that year was "Abolish Slavery in All Circumstances." Um, we we learned uh, from from what needed to happen. Uh, it and so. When that passed by a two-to-one margin, same state, same population, it shows that these differences really do matter. Um, and then when people started reaching out to Kamau and, and, and connecting um, with him, and, and we said, well, let's, let's bring them together. I mean, this was right at the beginning of the pandemic, so everything was happening on Zoom anyway. And all those early meetings were Zoom meetings. We, we didn't get to even meet each other face-to-face -to -face for about a year. <laughs> but. But this whole thing uh, it came together and more and more state connections have happened and the federal level work is continuing to grow. And I, you know, I just, because of all of those historical pieces, I just feel a responsibility to do this work. And I hope you feel whatever is the part of your own history that makes this important, that makes it salient to you, that you feel that obligation, and if you're listening, that you feel that obligation to work on this, because um, this isn't the end of the story. It's the beginning of the story. There's a lot more with, the, with our criminal justice system that's wrong than this, but this is fundamental because it's in the Constitution, and, um, and, and it has been one of the joys of my life to work with this team, and thank you, Kamau, and thank you for stepping in, Savannah. I am looking forward to, to working with uh, with you on this too, and thank all of you because it, it's it's one of the most important things I've ever had the opportunity and the blessing to work on. Thank you, Nathan.
Sister Savannah, you have taught us some lessons along the way, and other state representatives here understand that lesson, that all states are not created equal. Um, we can't do the same campaigns in different states because in the South, they are for real, for real about their slavery. They want their slavery. And they're not trying to hear nothing else about that taking away slavery. Uh, and we found that out really in a tough way with the, the Texas campaign, just about how they would act when we were presenting them this, with this idea. And uh, we did put the bill in, in Texas, as she'll explain to you, uh, which uh, didn't pass that time, but we're ready to do it again. Tell us a little bit about the hardships and the problems with this type of uh, bill in the South. So thank you, Max. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. Just briefly, like, I just want to talk about the, the energy in the room, right? Because when Kamal was talking about energy, I really just felt like an overflow of just a gush of positive energy. And I don't know if it's the Holy Spirit, I don't know if it's Allah, I don't know who it is, but somebody is in this space. But I want you guys to understand how important it is for you to know who you are. That is really the driving point in this work. Whether, as Nathan said, you find that your family members and you have a history of slaveholders in your family, whether you are the oppressed, we all linearly are affected by this issue. I actually um, got in this work by um, being connected with somebody who's incarcerated in the penitentiary in Miss Mississippi. And he saw uh, an event that I did in Texas on social media and reached out to me and said, hey, I'm planning this event. It's gonna be partially um, in person. It's gonna be a partial webinar. Um, can you help? And I was like, well, what are you talking about? What event, you know? And he said, it's gonna be called Free the 13th. And he told me about the premise, of course, um, abolishing slavery and ending the exception. Um, so I said, you know, I didn't know slavery was still legal. Like, I'm really a rookie at this. But as you can tell, like, I'm up here with these people now because, like, I may not win the war, but I'm going to keep fighting. And battle after battle, we're going to do this thing. But I said, okay, what do you want me to do? Put me in, coach. Put me in, coach. So I met Dennis. I met Max. And we actually had... Who else was going? There were a lot of people in the Jamelia was a part of the event. Yeah, shout out to Jamelia Lamb, one to of Jamelia the old Lamb. Yeah, of in this. California. She started this with us. But we did a webinar. Um, it was online and then a five day webinar. And at the at the summation, um, each representative, each state representative who was able to had an in person rally or event in their state. And I was thinking about the ways that I can uh, tie Texas in because I wasn't sure if anybody else was doing the work. <laughs> However, Phoebo and Max told me, hey, there's this guy doing the work in Texas. And Max says, his name's David Johnson. And there's two million people in Texas. So I'm like, David Johnson, like, uh, you know. And then, and then the way I am, I'm like, okay, is he black? Like, that's gonna narrow it down. But it just happened to be the one David Johnson that I didn't know, right? <laughs> so, and that's what I'm saying, this is God's work, right? And so I told David, I was like, you're reaching out to my people. Oh, let's do this together. And that's how the Coalition to Abolish Slavery Texas was formed right and Texas is one of those states like New Jersey where we do not have language in our Constitution um, about slavery and voluntary servitude that uh, uh, actually defers to the 13th Amendment so we had to put language into our Constitution that said that slavery and involuntary servitude were prohibited and I've never really written a bill but you know, I know how to strike things out. I know how to use a computer. So I was like, let me just add this in there. <laughs> Our bill said slavery and involuntary servitude are prohibited, even as punishment for a crime. And it was just that simple. Now, I knew that the bill wouldn't get far because we didn't really have time to organize. But we did put on a very powerful um, organizing event where we had formerly incarcerated people who actually dressed up in the garments that 
or not the actual ones, but the colors and, and kind of a resemblance of what people on the inside look like in the state uh, prisons in Texas. And they actually sang the cadences that they sang when they did the labor. We had a mock sale, and it was just a great event. And it was in the county where uh, the Sugarland 95 are, which are the, uh, you know, the convicts. <laughs> Yeah, the the, um, the people who were are buried, they're actually on school property. However, anyway, our bill, House Joint Resolution 51, um, did not receive a hearing. We were blackballed, stonewalled. They didn't answer my calls. They, nobody wants to talk to me. So what I learned in this is we have to have minions, right? Because they hear my name, they're like, oh, here she goes, like my slavery again. And I'm coming. Every time I'm coming. So um, my goal is to build our coalition to where we have leaders. We have emerging leaders who can not just speak the, the not just speak about the message, but who can actually teach because that's really important as we're learning to go out in the community and teach other people in our community. But anyway, that's how Texas got started. I'm just um, so blessed to be a part of this team and looking forward to uh, refiling our bill in 2023. Yes, we might fall down, but we get up. That's right. That's right. We get up, and Tennessee, they, they're on their fifth try. Is it fourth, fourth? What did he say, five years in a row? No. The same thing? Huh? No, we got it on the ballot the first time up. You got, we didn't get it through two legislative sessions, but uh, we're on the ballot the first time. Okay, yeah. I, I know Ohio is on their fourth try now. California is on their second try. It doesn't matter how many times you tr you're trying, the accomplishment is what you're after. The trying is just the way that you're getting this experience until you're successful. The goal is to end slavery, to honor our ancestors and the sacrifices that they made and finally finish this job. And with that being said, I want to give Brother uh, Kamal another opportunity to say a few words uh, before we get into some more poetry with Tribal Ray. I, I, I just can't... Um I cannot overstate how beautiful this moment is. You heard the stories of how, how this uh, modern abolition movement has gained momentum. And I just wanna say that this is only the beginning. This is only the beginning, that we will not rest until slavery is abolished once and for all in this country, both in law and in practice. Right. So this is the first of many steps and what I'm inviting uh, what we are all inviting you to is to take the rest of these steps with us. That you do not have to do this alone. That this is a network, a national network of organizers, activists, people who raise hell, rabble rousers, ministers, <laughs> ministers <laughs> troublemakers, talk too much. people who talk too much. <laughs> but we are beautiful, we are capable, we are abolitionists. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Kamal. Um, yes, when we say end slavery, that's exactly what we mean. This is slavery. The Constitution calls it slavery, and we should call it slavery, too. We have the largest prison population that has ever existed on planet Earth. Uh, and it is very much race-based and always has been. In states like Louisiana, the vast majority, majority of those inmates in the state are black people. We had a meeting recently where uh, Reverend Anderson joined us on Abolition Today, and she explained to us that 100%, 100% of the juveniles in their juvenile detention centers are black young men. 100%, like there's no white bad kids in all of Louisiana, it's just all black kids. And we have more black men behind bars or in cages than the top five populated African nations do combined. That's sad. I'm a, my wife and I are, are grandparents many times over, and half of my grandchildren are young men. And I have to explain to them that one in three of them are expected to go to prison. If that was a virus right. Right. or a disease yeah. or something else, everybody would be trying to make sure that it ends, that we reduce that number, that this thing would be done. But for some reason, it doesn't seem like enough of us care that I have to explain to my grandchildren that one in three of them are going to end up in prison. Not my 
And so we're going to do this work. And you're going to be there with us to get it done. Uh, with that being said. Max, time for a Q&A, a quick Q&A. Yes, a, a quick one. Yeah, we have a quick one. All right. So if, if you do have a few questions, let's go ahead and take them real quick for the Abolish Slavery National Network administration team. How does one get involved? For those that are nervous, how does one get involved without rough and feathers or those that feel like they don't want to rough feathers? How do they get involved, though? Anybody want to take that one? How do you get involved? Well, um, so we love this question because we want you to get involved. So um, one of the ways that you can get involved, um, um, especially, you know, especially for those listening on the internet, we're going to ask you to go to abolishslavery.edu. That is the Abolish Slavery National Network website. Dot US. Dot US. US. I'm so sorry. Uh, See, the lawyer is already on the EDU thing. Abolish Slavery. Dot US. All of, literally, all of my emails have been dot EDU for the past like two weeks. Is what I mean. But yes, go to Abolish Slavery. Dot US. And um, on, on there, you'll be able to, um, to email us uh, uh, directly. Um, now the other thing too yeah. is if you are in one of the uh, the five states where uh, where slavery is being abolished, we ask you to be in touch with the organizers leading those uh, campaigns. Uh, I cannot stress this enough because um, Abolish Slavery National Network at its core is a grassroots movement. That at its core, um, we defer to the grassroots organizers leading these local campaigns. And because of that, we're gonna ask you to get directly in touch uh, with those members um, as well. Um, and if you don't know how to get in touch with them, get in touch with us through our website and we'll be happy to connect with you. Thank you, Kamal. Yes, go to the website, join the mailing list. If you're looking online and you wanna know how you get, can get involved, just ask us, we'll send you directly to those organizers in the various states. Also make some donations. This, does not happen for free, it costs money. It costs money to get us here, it costs money to do all that we're doing, so make a donation while you're there. You also can support the federal campaign by di by texting uh, 252886, text 252886, one word, well, it's actually several words, but write it as one word, and the exception. So, and the exception, to 52886, and that will send a letter of support to your local representative as well as your federal representative. So you can do those things as well. We got one more question. One more question. Where you at? <laughs> Brother Isaac. Not so much a question, but I, you can't pass by this you know, amazing moment and just go into poetry. I definitely want to acknowledge you guys. You guys are angels on earth, I mean, in this, this hell we're living in. Um, I do want to elaborate more on what Kamal was saying. There is no, um, there's no losing in this fight. That's right. You know what I'm saying? There's more work. Ohio, ten, you know, uh, was ten, Tennessee Ohio, is on there. Ohio, Texas, California. They yeah. own their multiple tribes. You know, That's so right. there is no, there's no stop. We just have to have more uh, troublemakers and <laughs> abolitionists. So procreate. We love troublemakers. No, there we go. There's no losing in this fight. Absolutely. That's what I meant as well. There's no losers. We're just making our way to getting it done. Um, thank you, Isaac. Anyone else? All right. The, the finger thing he gave me. He did this. <laughs> Wrap it up, Max. Um, I want to say thank you to all of my peers here in the Abolish Slavery National Network. You guys are absolutely wonderful. So give it up for yourselves for doing this. Superheroes in my eyes. I also want to recognize those who are not here at this time. Jamelia Land of California, who ran ACA3, and her husband, Samuel Brown, who wrote the bill from while he was inside prison. I uh, also want to shout out to our fiscal sponsor, March On, who made a lot of things possible for us that were not possible previously and helped us to get some miracles done. I'm looking forward towards the future. And with that being said, once more, ladies and gentlemen, give it up for the wonderful Tribal Ring.
people get ready. There's a change coming. Cause the revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be radialized. I'm here to tell you that the revolution will be poeticized. It'll be broken down, handed over, and elucidated for young minds. It's time, my people, it's time. For the griots and spoken word artists to unite as one because the day has come for us to claim our 40 acres and a mule. Our just due and justice for one and all. It's time to heed the call. Stand up, stand up, stand up, and step up. To the microphone, the stage, the voter's box on the corner because the revolution will be poeticized, immortalized, recognized for the powerful movement that it is. Like Martin said, I have a dream. That's right. Get on board and let your voices be heard for the masses. Equality, equality, equality through all classes. We demand dignity, humanity, the right to retain our sanity and the freedom to say hell no to the so-called elected elite. Those who hold seat in political offices who get to decide how we live our lives. Forget that. The revolution will be poeticized so that we, the people, can be heard and our words will reverb and have repercussions the world over. Whispered words, whispered words, whispered words that echo and become shouts of revolution, evolution, change. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be radialized. The revolution, Sean, will not be trivialized. It will not start on Monday evening and end on Monday night. We, as a people, cannot go down without a fight. The revolution will be poeticized. We'll be kicking butts and taking names. It's time to wake up and stop playing games because our people are dying out there in the streets. AIDS, poverty, starvation ain't no joke. It's killing us, people. They are killing us. Wake up. Because the revolution is now. The revolution is now. And I'm going to need all of you to stand up. Go out there and vote in November and affect the change. Trevor Wayne. All right, with that being said, uh, that concludes the first segment of our panel discussion featuring the Abolish Slavery National Network administration members, and now we want to get into the second half of our panel discussion, which includes, of course, our host here and the states being represented here today. So if I can get our state representatives to come up to the stage here, and uh, I believe, Mark, you're going to be one of our reps? All right. Uh, Mark, do you, did you... All right, just give us a second. Come on up to the stage and have a seat, Ben, our state representatives and our federal representative. And, okay, I'm sorry, so we'll have Savannah representing Alabama. Uh, of course, we have representatives here from Vermont with Mark and Debbie. Louisiana is being represented by Brother Curtis. We have Tennessee with Jeannie, Jeannie here, and of course the federal amendment with Brother Jorge. So I'm gonna pass the mic over to you, Debbie. Wait a minute. It's all yours. Hold on for a minute. So here's, here's, what, here's what we should do, Max. Actually, if you don't mind if Debbie and I can serve as a team. Sure. And then you can just facilitate. You want me to keep doing what I'm doing? Is that okay? Is you that guys like Max? Is Max, o is Max okay? How good is Max as a host? All right, so how about if we just keep it? All right, and all right. Me and Debbie can team up here because we're partners. Because we're, we're You can future. take me home with you when you're done. Yeah, yeah, we, <laughs> yeah we, we got a lot in common. All right, let me get out of your way. All right, then, awesome. Um, let's start out by getting commentary from our hosts here today. You guys are wonderful. You made us feel so welcome. We feel blessed to know all of you and to be here with you. So, Debbie? Well, thank you very much. It's an honor to be up here uh, with all of you. Um, well, abolitionists, it's, it's really uh, exciting to be part of this historic movement. And it's always good to be with my uh, good troublemaker uh, pal here, uh, Mark Hughes. Um, I, I would just say that um, I, I feel particularly blessed to be in a position um, in which I, I was the uh, state senator who um, who actually introduced the proposal to um, to amend our constitution here in Vermont, and that was because <laughs> it's it's a great honor. But um, it, that what happened, you know, Savannah was talking about the Holy Spirit and God and all this kind of uh, amazing stuff. Um, 
what happened was I, when I was running for the state senate um, several years ago, uh, Mark had a forum for candidates, and he asked uh, the he asked each one of us um, if we knew that our um, state constitution had uh, you know had allowed slavery, and we all of course were just. We were floored. We had no idea. And um, at that time, you know, I, I said, well, if, if I'm elected, I, I promise you we will do something about that. And uh, so I did go on to get elected. And um, and so worked with Mark to come up with language to um, propose an amendment to the Constitution. And we worked hard to get it through, through you know, the committees. And, and it had to get approved by both uh, chambers of our legislature twice and so we, we worked together all through that and then um, I, I actually ran for higher office and lost so I'm not in the Senate anymore but I have continued to run um, an organization called Vermont Interfaith Action uh, which has since uh, become a close partner with the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance with Mark's organization and so we decided to team up to have this um, organizing campaign to get Prop 2 passed by our electorate, which is the final stage in getting the Constitution amended. Um, so I really, really feel um, uh, doubly blessed that I've been able to, to see this campaign from different sides of the equation, and absolutely that I've been able to, uh, to work with Mark uh, throughout this whole thing. So, Thank you, opinion? Debbie. Awesome. Uh, Brother Mark? Yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's pretty amazing. Um, when we were, just to give y'all some perspective, you know, because remember we were talking on the national side, we were talking about timelines, about what was going on, what was happening in Colorado, like for example, what was happening in Colorado in, in 2018, for example, uh, 2016, and so forth. Um, and there's a lot of intersections too, like Faith in Action, which is former PICO, uh, which is the, the, the national organization is now uh, you know, our other national partner, but we'll get back to that. But the, the work started here in, in Vermont um, with, with actually a C4 called Justice for All that I, I started uh, back in, I think it was 2014, uh, having found, um, turned, turned on media and found Michael Brown did and had just in the wake of um, just Trayvon Ma Martin at the time. So that's when I that's when I started the activism work, not the abolitionist work, but the ab, but the activism work, in starting Justice for All C4, uh, which led to a coalition that passed a a major what was meant to be a criminal justice system oversight apparatus, um, but it was during that work that with Justice for All, it, with in coalition with maybe 35 other organizations that we began to understand just the depth and the breadth of the so-called criminal justice system, as well as the, just the sprawling uh, in, an industrial complex, which is known as the legacy of slavery, uh, systemic racism, um, as it's being produced out of housing, education, employment, health services, economic development. Um, so that's what caused, us, caused me to dig into the Constitution because frankly I was befuddled uh, because I was just beginning to awaken to the realities of the realities and I think that's what ca that's what caused me to stumble across the Constitution in 2015 uh, in Vermont uh, understanding that there must be some source of our protection of our safety of there has to be constitutionally something that assures our human rights in this state. So in a search for that, I found the opposite, uh, which was slavery in our Constitution. And it wouldn't be until um, 2019 that we would have the opportunity to get it on the ballot, because many of you know you can only get it on the ballot every four years here in the state of Vermont. Uh, so that's kind of how the work began. And we, peripherally, I did see Colorado arise, uh, you know, emerge and, and then crash and burn. Uh, during that time, and quite frankly, over the time that we've been doing this work in the state, uh, it was really from the outside in as opposed from the inside out, if you know what I mean, Curtis. So, us, so there are some of us who are sitting on the outside, like Christine, who's doing reentry for about a dozen years here in Burlington, 
and me myself doing the national research and understanding that we have one in 14 black men in this state in prison right now. And despite the fact that only 1.4% of the population of the state is black, 11% of the, of the prison is black folk. So, so the, the research was, was less, um, it had more to do with quantitative analysis and not a whole lot of the reality of what it is that we're having the opportunity to connect with now nationally. So now we see the connection. Um, now we're, you know, we're standing up and we're, we're wide awake and we're understanding that this is not just a connection to the legacy of slavery, which is systemic racism here on the ground in the work that we're doing and we have continued to do since, but it's also a connection uh, to a much broader challenge because the fact is, is that slavery was never abolished because the 13th Amendment saw to that, and we want to be one of those states that connect to the four states that have already made that commitment, the five states that are going to make it this year, and probably the dozen states that do it next year until we move to a point where we have about 38 so we can go in and do the real work of abolishing slavery as a nation once and for all. Amen. You know, just want to add a little story to it. I remember one of my favorite moments of working with you guys here is when people from all over the country came to testify on behalf of what Vermont was trying to achieve. That's right. And that alone was wonderful, but the next day was even better when Representative Peter, what's the last name, Peter? Well, Representative Peter, he, he was out right, what's his name? Let's call him Peter. Yeah, Pete, Peter. <laughs> He was on and he was like, you know, we had all these educators and historians coming and tell us, but nobody ever told us that not only were we the first ones to introduce an exception clause, but it had expanded across the country because of what we had done. That's right, we learned that along the way. Right, that nobody seemed to have known that. And that was a, that was a beautiful moment for us to see those eyes open like that, to understand that you may not have intended to do major damage, but major damage is what happened. And an example of that would be Louisiana. Louisiana adopted that very same exception clause, and they had a much more malicious intent to use it uh, than Vermont did. So let's go ahead and speak to Brother Curtis Davis, who is the lead organizer for the Incarcerate Louisiana, and talk about those connections. Uh, how are you doing again? Uh, Max Parthas. Uh, and um, I want to say thanks to Mark for inviting us out to hold this event in Vermont. Vermont is a lot of things. And we talked about the racial equity problem, which is really, according to one of my new close friends that I learned, it's just a form of apartheid, right? Yeah. So it, when we talk about the type of work that you're doing down in Louisiana, you got to know everything based on race. But I found out some things about Vermont since I was here. Did you guys know that there's 42,000 people in the city of Burlington, Vermont, right? And out of those 42,000 people, only 16 black families actually own their home. I think it's 13. 13? 13? Yeah, 13, only 13. 16, 42,000 people worse are here. <laughs> That is a racial apartheid, economically, housing-wise, financially. That we don't even have that problem in Louisiana. Right. Right. So we say, well, my, your ghetto ain't no harder than mine or whatever. <sighs> a lot of people own homes in Louisiana. A lot of black people own homes in Louisiana. So we have this high level of education here in Vermont. We have the situation where Bernie Sanders is getting y'all a whole lot of money up here to take care of 600,000 people in Vermont. But I know now that you're up against a more insidious fight oh, than yes. mine. Oh, yeah. See, in Louisiana, they let you know out loud, we don't like you, nigga. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right? In Vermont, I've partied with a lot of good white people, and I've had fun, and I have not felt any racism since I've been here. But to think about the invisible scientific fact that you guys not get nothing. And you, uh, we can treat you like love, but at the same time, hey, you can't have none of this stuff. Right. So I'm here to support him. Louisiana, we gonna win, believe that. We fight, we win, 
we expose what's going on and we get down and dirty. And when they say, yeah, we just want to keep our heritage alive. We get, if, if it's no more slavery, then how is my heritage, my traditions? I, I mean, what, what's what you're taking from us? Heritage, hereditary, race. People are actually arguing that they're supposed to be in a superior racial position based on a law. We have to make this as plain as possible in every arena that we find ourselves. Let me give y'all that. Fight hard here in Vermont. Fight hard with the knowledge that this is not just a racial equity problem. This is apartheid. When no black people get to have a house that they can own. Wait a minute, it was better than that in South Africa. So this is serious. Name it something. Look at it and make the international world look at Vermont and say, shame on you, Vermont. Shame on you for even letting these black people think that they're doing good up here and they don't own the land. If you don't own the land, you don't have a stake. So, not to preach, but I'm gonna let y'all go with that. Thank you, Brother Curtis. Indeed. Another state that is a direct result of the actions of Vermont in 1777 would be Tennessee. Tennessee has also got a unique history with slavery and racism, yes. the birthplace of the KKK. Hello, uh, right now, they have the uh, America's largest for-profit prison is located right there in Tennessee, Core Civic, formerly known as CCA. But Tennessee is kicking behind and taking names. Uh, you've got a lot of Republicans that are on your side now. You've started to gain some resources to be able to get this campaign going. And you've got uh, a lot happening in Tennessee. So ladies and gentlemen, Jeannie Alexander, the lead organizer for the Tennessee campaign. No exceptions. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about your kind of struggle. Um, yeah, our campaign is... Is that better? Oh, it is better. It's a lot better. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Our campaign, I would say, is a bifurcated campaign. There is grassroots campaign, and there's a more traditional side, traditional, that's a word, word, uh, side to that campaign. Um, but, but yeah, there is a really long history there, and I think that what's incredibly important about our campaign in Tennessee is that it came from the inside out. So I think it's helpful for people to kind of understand some history and how it happened. Um, and the way that this campaign um, came out of cages was a, a promise, basically. Um, it was a promise that I made. I was um, an abolitionist who was a prison chaplain, and that is a whole other story, but made a promise to someone who educated me. Uh, my friend, Mujahideen, who was the first person to tell me Right, a theologian with also a legal background, a former lawyer, that um, slavery had never been abolished. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Right? I mean, I, I didn't know it either. And, um, and he educated me to that fact. And so I said, well, okay, we're going to end this. He's like, okay, Chaplin. <laughs> okay. I'm like, no, we're going to do this. We are going to do this in Tennessee. Um, and at that point, then I left that position and then co-founded No Exceptions with Insiders. And that's what the meaning of our organization's name has always been. No Exceptions Prison Collective has always been about that there should be no exceptions to the abolition of slavery. That's right. Um, and at that point then, I wrote a bill. Mike Martin <laughs> wrote a bill. And this is crazy, y'all, but it basically sell through the Tennessee legislature. We had to make it through two sessions. That first time, no one voted against it because we just kind of honestly, and for anyone else who's listening to this in the southern state, we just kind of okie doked it. We're like, oh, well, this is crazy, right? She would have it in here. You're not a racist, are you? And they were just like, oh, all these Republicans are like voting for it. So nobody votes against the first time. The second time, during the second legislative session, they, some of them begin to show some true colors. And we had two vote against it in the House and four in the Senate. And of course, the rationale was, well, we don't have to do this. This isn't real. Right. I'm like, no, right. no, for real, for real. It's right there. <laughs> <laughs> it's really real. Um, but it's still overwhelmingly passed. And so now we are on the ballot uh, for the first time. 
Um, and the vote will be November the 8th. And like Curtis, we're very confident that we are going to pass this. Um, it has a lot of momentum behind it. A lot of politicians have signed on to it. Uh, a lot of Republican politicians have signed on in, to endorse it. And it's got a growing um, massive grassroots campaign. And honestly, it wouldn't have gotten here without grassroots. Um, so that's absolutely essential. Um, and then also, without the support of ASNM, this is also absolutely essential. If this, is, this is family, and this is, this is abolition. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Jean. Uh, yes, Pastor, feel free to take it. I just want to say to uh, Sister Gina Kenny, who is uh, the lead organizing representative for Ohio, she's managing our stream yard today. Uh, thank you, Gina. If uh, Pastor Kenneth shows up, please patch him in for us, okay? Um, in the meantime, I'm going to move over to our federal amendment and Brother Jorge. Uh, it, you know, I had, I'm just, am I saying it wrong? Tell me how You're to say it. Perfect. Okay. I'm saying it perfect? Yeah. Oh, all right. Uh, and he is one of the representatives working with the federal arm with Worth Rises uh, to remove the exception clause or rather repeal the 13th Amendment and replace it with no exceptions whatsoever. And also, he is a formerly incarcerated individual who is making these things happen. Uh, Brother Jorge, tell us a little bit about yourself and the federal amendment and where we're at. Yeah, a couple of things first. Uh, thank you, Vermont. Uh, yes. Never been here. I lived in Massachusetts for a bit. And I'm just glad I'm not in Massachusetts again. I'm in Vermont. If you're formerly incarcerated in no Massachusetts, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> you know, when I was coming to Vermont, I told a couple of people, and they all said, you know, I was burning. And I'm like, no, Debbie. You're the woman, you know, I'm right. It's an honor to meet you, to meet a former state representative, state it's senator it's who's wearing deal. that shirt. That's just, wow, wow, wow. Yeah, uh, move to Texas if you don't mind. Yeah, my name's Jorge. Uh, I'm the National Criminal Justice Director of a group called Latino Justice. Uh, yeah, I did spend a lot of time in Texas cages, been out 14 years now on parole for another 30. Yeah, that's the way they do it in Texas. Uh, it was just for robbery, but still, I don't care. You know, um, yeah, uh, it's really glad to be here and meet people who I've seen on Zoom for a while. Kamal, uh, Max, some other folks. Uh, and I want to say, Jeannie, I don't know if you don't remember, and I did when I, when I heard your name, when I was at Grassroots six, seven years ago, and we were working on the video calling campaign, I reached out to you, and I think Tex was in Tennessee and we've done some stuff, so yeah, it's really, it's really good to meet you too. Um, yeah, the national campaign, in the exception.org, right? If y'all have not been there, go there, please. Uh, it is the coalition of individuals who are working on the federal campaign. Uh, shout out to uh, Worth Rises, as you all know, Bianca Talek, Luke, uh, some of the other folks over there, Daniel. Uh, shout out to uh, Anti-Recidivism Coalition in California. Michael and Michael Mendoza is going to shake it for all the work that they're doing. I'm on the steering committee for, uh, again, for that. And what we, again, what we're doing is we're trying to do this on a federal level. But I want to concede, and people need to concede and understand that, like Jeannie said, this, or this movement is a grassroots movement. And grassroots movements mean that it's local, and that it's state, and that it's federal. If not for what y'all are doing in the states, we wouldn't be moving anything on the federal level. Right. We depend on y'all, we take your lead. We're, we're basically there to support what's happening on the state level. And what, you know, we, we do a lot of stuff to amplify. Like, we, like we'll take the big holidays, of course, Labor Day, right? And we'll do a lot of stuff on Labor Day. We're having something on Labor Day in New York. For y'all who are in New York or go to New York or want to cross that water, I'm not a geography major, so I don't know if you cross the water here, if you're in the city, or if you've got to go another thousand miles. But they are having something there uh, at, at the Havana Outpost on September 5th, right? And they're having, it's weird how some of these things do. They came to me and told me, what are some of the things we should do? I heard my brother here in Louisiana talking about some of the work they do down there, right? In Texas, they have something they call flag weeding. It's where you take a grubbing hole and you get like a bunch of folks in a line and you raise it up, put it four times and take a step and you do that all day, all day. It's make work, right? It is slave labor, it is hard labor, and I propose that they have some grubbing holes there for the folk to show up and put them in a the line and do that, and they said, no, that's a little bit too hard. I'm like, we want them to understand 
what's going on in those cages, what's going on behind those fences, what's going on if you go under the wire and can't come out every night, right? And that's a little bit too rough. But anyway, they, they blew off my, my suggestion. But they're, we're having a lot of stuff uh, on in September in Philadelphia, right? They're having an art installation there with the, the folks doing the mural stuff, right? Uh, a shout out to Phoebe on Constitution Day. They're having something the 16th and the 17th, and they're showing a film on the 16th. If, you, if you're close to Philly, if you show up, go to that, please. Uh, so yeah, again, anything that y'all can do to support us, great, but uh, y'all just keep doing what y'all are doing. And I'm in Texas, and Savannah knows that I am at her service, that I'm gonna do what Savannah tells me, and that I will use my contact to take you whatever we can to push that. Yeah, you know that. Yeah, you do, brother, don't pay that. Don't pay that. I'm right. that. Thank you, Brother Jorge, uh, much appreciated. Indeed, give it up. Um, we're going to go on to our other state. Before that, I want to give a shout out once again to our activists in Oregon who were unable to make it to here today. Uh, they are doing so well with their campaign. The lead organizer is Riley Burton. And originally it was Jordan Schott, but Jordan Schott has moved on to become an assistant to Senator Merkley. Uh, awesome. And she, yes. And all of them are going to law school. Like, all these people who are getting involved in abolition suddenly going into law school. I wonder why that is. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. So shout out to them. Uh, I see that we still don't have representative, uh, a representative for Alabama on line. That would be uh, Brother Kenneth Glasgow Sharp. Savannah's right here. Yeah, we, we're going to get to her. We're gonna, she can cover Alabama, right? Yeah, I'm going to talk about that. <laughs> Stop trying to steal my job, man. Like, we, now I gotta give you an hour's pay. Is that how I gotta do it? So, happen when you come in my house. <laughs> so, uh, as of now, Brother Glasgow is the lead organizer for our Alabama campaign, but unfortunately, he is not able to make it here tonight. But the one who started out working on this and was very instrumental is Sister Savannah Eldridge. From the very beginning, we kind of snuck this whole bill in. <laughs> And I'll leave it up to you to tell whatever stories you want to tell and the position that we're in with Alabama. Savannah Eldridge. Yeah. So Alabama, right? Um, the Bible Belt of the South. Um, I know a little bit about the way the South works. And um, I'm on the internet all day. So I just happened to see that Amendment 4 had passed in Alabama, which called for the recompilation of the Alabama Constitution, which is the longest constitution in the nation. Um, so they proposed to uh, make some changes to remove racist language from the Constitution in Alabama. So I was like, I thought that'd be a great idea to remove slavery from it. What's more <laughs> racist than slavery, right? And for me, it was like a shortcut. And I mean, I don't just sit around thinking, well, I do sit around thinking about ways to make things easier for myself, but it just made sense. So I tried to reach out to the organizers who pushed the bill, um, and from that meeting came a meeting with um, the powers that be in Alabama, and we were able to get the language uh, on the ballot for this, uh, this year. So I'm very excited about it. There's really not a whole lot to tell. It wasn't a, a separate bill. It's tied into, uh, it's a comprehensive, there's three total changes that are being proposed to the Alabama Constitution. So there wasn't a lot of organizing around this intentionally on my end, but we're happy to have Pastor Glasgow, who is from Alabama, uh, to be able to support this piece of legislation, because of course I'm going to be very busy in the near future, um, you know, building Texas back up and then supporting all the rest of the states. So um, that's how Alabama came to be, and if we get this, it's a one and done, and I'm just excited about it. But it's just a testament to, of what, why strategy is important, and legislation for me is really a long-term goal and it's great that we can keep trying and we can keep trying but if we can collectively put our heads together to look at what works in our state then we should do it right uh, and think outside the box let's get creative about it and i think that uh, we'll definitely see more changes to come in the near future thank you savannah it, it was a pretty funny moment, too, when we were in the meeting with the organizers for Amendment 4, and one of the women said, you know, um, I've looked through this thing for 20 years, and there's nothing in this Constitution about slavery. Uh, so I don't know what you're talking about. 
And we were like, well, just check out section 32, article 2, and read that. And she read it, and you could see her eyes like, I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know. And we run across that all the time. People didn't, don't know. And so we give them the opportunity to find out. And once you know, you become responsible for what you know. You get a chance to do something about it. Let me and just say they that. had a chance. I'm right. sorry, I forgot to mention, like a lot of this work is built from the inside out. And we had worked on Free the 13th with the Free Alabama Movement. And I wanna give a shout out to Kinetic Justice and venue Hannibal Rasa who have taken so many risks to bring awareness to what's going on in the Alabama Department of Corrections and really, really built the inside campaign from the ground up. So shout out to them um, and their contribution to this work. Amen, indeed. Shout out to Kinetic and Bennu. Uh, I remember Bennu was hosting a radio program on Abolition Today from inside solitary confinement. Yes. That is amazing. It lasted 28 weeks. Yeah. If you want to see it or hear any of that, you can go to abolitiontoday.org and look at our archives for tales of, for Hi. live from the plantation. And you'll hear all incarcerated people discussing this issue of slavery and their families. It's an amazing revolutionary thing. All right, so we're coming up on the Q&A section. So uh, uh, unless anybody want to make any more comments, I'm going to go ahead and pass it out to the audience. Debbie? Thanks. I, I would like to just make one more comment, if I may. Um, you know, I, I, I wanted to say something as a, as a white person uh, being involved in this movement. Um, and, you know, Brother Curtis was talking about, uh, about white, how, how white Vermont is. And um, I grew up um, in, the, in the Deep South. I, I was born uh, outside, of, outside of Savannah, Georgia, actually, right. in, a, in, a, in a really small town. And, you know, I was, I was a kid. I was born in 1962. Now, now you know how old I am. Um, but, you know, in, so during the Civil Rights Movement, um, my parents were actually really well-meaning white people. They, um, you know, when we were at home and when we talked around the dinner table, they, you know, they always said, you know, they taught me to respect everybody. They told me that every human being deserved dignity and they fully supported the civil rights movement and they admired Dr. Martin Luther King and, you know, and they said all these things in the four walls of our home. Right. <laughs> and then when we got outside, you know, my dad was a businessman in the area and my mother, you know, was a stay at home mom uh, and, you know, played bridge with, with ladies and, and uh, you know, um, participated in the women's group at church and, and all. And they did not say the things outside to other white people that they said to us and me and my sisters at home. And it took me a long time, you know, when you grow up in that kind of environment, you don't always, you don't always get it until you get older. But, but I came to realize that... Um, it's not, it wasn't okay, you know, for them to do. They were protecting their business, they were protecting their reputation, they were, they didn't want other white people to come after them, you know, they, they didn't have the courage of, you know, really of their convictions. Yeah. And, yeah. and I, um, you know, I, I want to be different. And I, you know, you, you, you made the comment too that, you know, once you know something, you, you can't unknow it. Once you know uh, what, what's what, uh, you have to take responsibility for your contribution to it. Um, and, you know, as far as I know, my, my, my ancestors were kind of poor farmers. They didn't actually own, uh, you know, own uh, slaves. They didn't have plantations, but that doesn't make me any, any less culpable as a white person. And it doesn't mean that I can be like my parents and just sit silently um, anymore. So, um, so I just, want, I just wanted to add that. Thank you, Debbie. Did anybody else want to make? Yes, clap for that. The courage of your convictions. You are an example of that. Would Let anybody else like to make some comments? Let me back on that, because um, cause Debbie and I work like really, really, really closely together. Um, just on a, on a daily, on almost a day. I mean, I, the phone will ring. I'll be like, hey, right? <laughs> it's you again. Right? And it's like we're talking like three, like three, four times a day. Exactly. So we're, we've really grown close and we've gotten uh, to um, to know each other, and we you know attended the faith in action trainings at the national level. We were in Philly. The speaker, the keynote speaker, Royster, who was he here yesterday, was a connection through Debbie uh, as a result of relationships that we established through faith in action. And it just goes on and on and on. 
and even my wife, uh, Christine, who's sitting back there, she's, who's probably thinking, I hope he doesn't say something stupid. Too late. Um, but, um, you know, she, she's like, you know what, you know, and this is something coming from Christine. She's like, Debbie's solid, right? She's like, Debbie, that's, you know, that's our people right there. So we, so I do, I do just want to lift you up and thank you for showing up and being a part of what's going on here tonight with us. Love you. Um, I want to also add to that, that this is not a drill. I mean, I came to understand this work, kind of like almost bass backwards, if, if you don't mind me saying that, um, in a way, because the way that I see abolitionists in the way that I have experienced abolitionists, it seems like it was more, you know, inside out, if you know what I mean, mm -hmm. Gene. And so it's, it's like that, Curtis, it's like that. But, but us, it's kind of like backing into it, and, you know, we talk about the data and, you know, and all that other stuff, and a lot of, Real abolitionists, I'm just going to use that, real abolitionists, folks who've been in there or who have really been shoulder to shoulder with the folks in there, probably thinking to themselves, get out of here with that data, you know, in a way, I, although it's important. And, and I guess I say that to say this, is, is the battle is no less real as we stand shoulder to shoulder. And I've come to understand the gravity of what it means to be an abolitionist and to not just to say it, but to walk it, because it's, because it's, not, uh, it's, it's not one of those hunky-dory, happy-go-lucky, you know, very positively friendly and um, warmly received types of walks of life. If anybody in here knows what I'm talking about, if you start, if, when you really get down to it, this here, this is, this is, this is the separator. This is, what, this is what separates us from everybody else. This is when people stop calling you and when people stop liking you, right? This, this is when you can walk away, from, you, you may as well walk away from that job or go do something different. This is that, okay, this is that kind of work. So I just, I wanna, you know, just give a shout out because as I've reached across, as I've looked across the country and I've looked at the condition of our people across this nation, I look into my own home state of Iowa it is, it is horrid. Now, one thing that the numbers do is they don't lie. The second one that they do is, is it gives you a picture. If you know what to look for, you have a pretty good idea of what's going on in, in Minnesota. You have a pretty good idea of what's going on in, in, in Wisconsin. You have a pretty good idea of what's going on, FIBO, in New Jersey. You have a, you have a, so these, so when you look at what's going on in Vermont, it's not an accident. It's not an accident that these things are happening when you start pulling restrictive covenants. It's not an accident, is what I'm saying. So seriously, the abolishment of slavery is just that important because it is, it is the foundation of all of this stuff that we're trying to get unpacked. Mm -hmm. Systemic racism, as we love to call it, or some people say equity, you know, or whatever you want to call it, you know, depends on whether you're at work or whether you're in the state government or something like that. But this, what we're really trying to do is we want to eradicate systemic racism. In other words, we, we, that, that is what this building represents. That is what the Kemp Center is all about, this work. That's the work that we're doing with cultural empowerment, with, with community engagement and support, with outreach and education, as, as well as platforms, which would be this. So what I'm getting at is, is that this is, this is the foundation of everything, this whole thing about slavery, this whole thing about slavery. And systemic racism, Max, we call it badges and incidents. If it were not for the institution of slavery, we would not have these disparities that we're trying to eradicate. That is how simple it is, and that is how serious it is. So we can go in and we can try to tinker around the edges on all of these systems all day long until we get tired. But at the end of the day, if slavery is still here, then we haven't done anything yet. That's all I gotta say about that. Uh, yes, thank you, Mark. Mic drop on that one. Indeed, uh, this is the root of it all. Uh, there is so much change that needs to be made but you really can't change any of it until you open the first door, right? You can't go into the house until you open the first door, and the first door is to end slavery. 
Once you've been in slavery, it opens up opportunities that we've never seen in this country before because we've never done it. And nobody can predict what will happen because we've never done it. But we want to do it, and we are going to do it. Brother Jorge, you had something you want to say? Yeah, just a couple of things, I think. Um, I have no idea how many of the people in this room have spent time in the cage. Um, I know that when I was in prison, you internalize the slave mentality. It's just, I thought that I deserved to be there, maybe not with a 60 year sentence the last time, right? But I deserved to be there because I had put a, a pistol at somebody's head and demanded that they give me money. Right? And it, 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 I think foundation cages in this country exist because we have a failure of imagination what to do with somebody harm somebody else. Right. We refuse yeah. to think about anything else. So this, we are here today to abolish slavery, but if we don't move forward and abolish the cage, if we're stopping and if we're accepting, then okay, 13th Amendment passed, you're no longer a slave. When you're in a cage, we're gonna pay you minimum wage, and now I can move on to another fight that I think that, I think that we, I think that we're turning our backs to the individuals who we are saying that okay, we have freed you now from that, from that, right? Because basically, slavery in prison, what it is, it's related to the labor, but it's not related to. It doesn't really attack how you feel when you're in there. And I don't know how this brother felt when he was in there. I don't know how I felt for a long time, right? I grew up believing that the Texas Rangers were heroes, good lawmen. I did not understand or realize or have been taught the history of the lynchings in South Texas, what these folks have done to us, none of my people. I didn't know that. It's a process of education. And what this man said, what Max said about once you know it, you can't unknow it, right? And I just think that I hope that people are committed to not just ending slavery, but to ending the cage itself. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Roy. Yes. All right, uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Brother Nathan. I just wanted to know if, uh, get in there, man. <laughs> if, um, if, to, to Curtis, if, if people want to know about your book, Slave State, or they want to learn more about your own history or about the history of slavery in Louisiana, where should they go? Um, they can go to Instagram, Curtis.DavisII. They can go to Decarcerate Louisiana's page on Facebook. They can go to Curtis Davis on Facebook. Um, or we're getting our website set up this week um, for our In the Exception Louisiana. Um, they can also go to Abolish um, Slavery US. Um, dot US. Dot US, I'm sorry. Abolish Slavery. Dot US and find out anything that they need to find out about what we're doing. And I really appreciate you guys getting that book, donating to us and supporting us because that's how we get around and um, we don't get the big grants um, from the the nonprofit industrial complex, but we're, we're working on it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Uh, just so you know, we do have books for Curtis right here available right now, as well as some jewelry and books from Tribal Rain. Any other questions from our uh, team out here in the audience? Books and jewelry from Tribal Rain. <laughs> I just want to uh, just commend all of you warriors. You guys are, are disciples. And it's, it's really inspiring to me um, to be an honoring for me to be a part of this and, and to be a part of this team. Uh, yesterday, uh, I was just getting a chance to kick it with Max. And what's really interesting is that, you know, I'm originally from Patterson, New Jersey myself. And I've also been you know, a victimized of police brutality when I was 13, just walking home from school. And there wasn't no rhyme or reason. Well, I, wouldn't, I didn't do anything. I was just walking while black. And, you know, and there was another time in which, you know, trying to break up a fight amongst little kids that were throwing at rocks. And, you know, being as it may, you know, it was a whole bunch of other men who came out and they were coming out with bats and we're going to, you know, intercept that. and. Call one out saying that it was a riot going on. Make a long story short, they end up locking me up and slamming my friend. I'm at the same time, only 13, just because you know we were trying to do something right. So for me, in my walk, I'm not just being you know knowing who I am and, and, and actually using basketball as a vehicle and brought me to the state of Vermont 
it also brought me a sense of awareness that, you know, like you all were saying, once you're awoke, you can't, you can't close your eyes to the, to the ills of the world. So for me, it's, you don't know how much energy, I'm, how, how much I'm replenishing right now and getting even stronger and dealing with stuff that just so happened to just, you know, happen to me around the district with the school system. And I've been in the school system in the district for about 20 plus years, so I'm really excited to come now from the outside, coming back in with a new lens and a new perspective for our people and to stand up and stand forward. So I just want to just applaud all of you just for recharging, for doing the work, and for, for now, you know, for me having that, that, that level of consciousness, awareness, and ammunition to go on and, and do so more, for, more so and knowing that I got a support and a family behind me. So I just want to tip my hat, tip my hat off to all of y'all. Thank y'all. Yes, okay. Marlon? Marlon! Should I stand up first? Stand up, Marlon, you young. So, thank you, Reverend Marlon. <laughs> um, my name is Marlon. I kind of came to the Kemp Center as a as an invitation from Brother Rajni Eddins. Um, he invited me to do some storytelling and poetry, and that's what I came here into the center, and that's how I met Reverend Mark Hughes. Um, as a member, as just a black person, I am so thankful to be here, thankful that there's other people who are willing to look into constitutions, and that's the hard, that's the hard part, that's the hard work, you know, sitting there using your time, you know, to better somebody else's life. and. You know, I just want to know how many other states do have like a Prop 2 on their ballot this year, and you know, what's the real significance of this year? So you said five, what, which five? We actually have one of the five that have joined us online. I'm gonna to try to see if we can get a few words from them, but the states that are on the ballot this year are Vermont, Oregon, Louisiana, Tennessee, and and Alabama, which I'll get ready to give a chance to speak. Thank you for your question, brother. So Alabama, Tennessee, Oregon, Louisiana, Vermont, all on the ballot this year in such an epic, epic opportunity. I can see Kenneth G. We got brother Kenneth Glasgow Sharpton on the line with us here, joining us in Zoom. He's the organizer for Alabama. Kenny, we got a few minutes for you, so uh, let me see if we can hear you say something. Wait, Pastor Glasgow, they can't hear you, so I'm gonna repeat what you said. So, he said what they're doing in the red state of Alabama is finally changing the language to abolish slavery. So he just wanted to give a shout out to everybody across the nation who is doing this thing. He wants everybody to know that you are changing America, that you are changing its very systems and, and its very core. And he's, he said that he's he's excited to he's excited that this is like not just from Alabama, but um, that we're uh, changing the language in these five states and in the federal to make sure that um, that we, we change all the laws in this country. I'm so sorry. I'm here. He said, "God bless y'all. God bless you." Oh, you got a question? Okay. To my Vermont people, especially um, Debbie, because you're my the first woman abolitionist I've ever met. <laughs> so shout out to you. So we heard what inspires um, you. How do you inspire other Vermonters? Maybe Mark can add to that. How do we get inspiration all the way to November, and how do we carry on and keep on as a Vermonter? Well, we are working on that. Um, <laughs> no, that's a great question. We um, um, we are actually doing some testing and messaging. Somebody. We, I was a little embarrassed because somebody said they didn't have money to hire a firm. Yeah, sorry, we, we actually did hire a firm. Uh, so, we're, so we're working on testing uh, out some of that. We've had some, some great volunteers, uh, you know, talking to random people uh, out on Church Street and at, at uh, farmer's markets. Um, you know, we have an idea of what people are, are thinking, how they're, they're surprised that these exceptions are in our Constitution. Uh, but we want to make sure that they're not, they don't just see the tip of the iceberg, that they're really understanding, you know, as Mark was talking about, you know, this is, a, this legacy of slavery is about 
the um, uh, contribution that it's made now to systemic racism and where we are in this country. So, you know, we're we're working at the grassroots. We're trying to to, to train our volunteers to, to you know to, to really talk the way that it needs to be said. And um, um, yeah, and then other than that, I just kind of tried to. Uh, uh, give it to like some of my colleagues when I was in the legislature when they, when they said stupid things. <laughs> but, talking to our people. but that's right, talking to my white people. That's right, that's right. But, yeah, what, what would you add? Mark? You know, I think I said it earlier. I'm, I'm, maybe I didn't say it earlier. I, did I? Did I say what a time to be alive? Yeah. Um, this this is you know we are literally fighting for our lives. And if that's not inspiring enough, I don't really have any words for folks, quite frankly. And the truth is, is there are some people who are going to be the ones who go down with the ship. And there's nothing that you can say to inspire them. And I, I'm sorry to give you the bad news, but you know, this, this is that, that thing we've been talking about all of this time. You know, they, somebody said if you throw a frog in a boiling pot of, of, of water, he'll jump out. But if you just warm it up slowly while he's in there, he won't jump out. And there's a lot of folk that right now, they're not going to jump out. It don't make no difference what you say to them. They're not going to jump out. If, I mean, if, if you turn the TV on right now, hello, somebody. This, we are in a time of our lives right now. And the fights that we're in right now, I hope your fights matter. Whatever you're engaging yourself in, Right now, whatever you're spending your time on, whatever you're spending your money on, however it is you're committing your time to other people right now, at, at a time such as this, whatever you're doing, make it count. Because truly, right now, these are some of our last times. Now, I don't, you can, you can, you can get all crazy on me and say, oh, this preacher done whatever, and, and you know what? I won't respond to you. Don't play with me. Today, we are at a place right now where every single one of us ought to be busy. And the work that we're doing ought to count. And if it don't, like she said, sit down and get out of my way. <laughs> That's how I inspire people. Thank you, Mark. All right. Let's give it up one more time for our state and federal representatives here, the Freedom Five, plus the Beckler. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you guys, thank you so much. We want, got a couple of more speakers and then we're gonna call it an evening. We know you could have been anywhere, but you're here with us and we so appreciate that. I wanna start by bringing up Savannah Eldridge. Savannah is gonna have the closing comments on behalf of the abolished Slavery National Network, and then we're going to get another poem out of Tribal Rain, and then we're going to hear from our host to take us home. Sister Savannah. I have to come to my notes. Thank you, Max. I have to come to my notes because my, my grandson's calling me Grandma Grandma, and I forgot everything I was going to say. Beautiful, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right, Can you hear me now? Oh, this is out. Is it? This one is all right. I can yell. No, you ain't gonna yell. Say something. All right. Oh, yeah, yeah. You got me, you got me. All right, guys. Well, first of all, thank you guys so much for being in attendance today. Um, I just wanted to share that um, ASNN, as a coalition of network partners, we are all respected leaders in our community. And I think that's important as we take everything that we've gained here back that leadership is the essence of these types of campaigns, right? We have to be able to galvanize the education, to galvanize the power that we gain to go and build uh, new coalitions. Uh, my vision for Abolish Slavery National Network is not just to build partnerships, but also to build leaders um, in order to achieve this, we need to get and stay connected. We need to stay connected as people. We need to stay connected spiritually. And we need to stay connected as a coalition, right? Again, as leaders, we're doing different things in our communities. But when we come back into these shared spaces, we need to think about 
what we can bring to support our partners. We've all got different strengths and weaknesses. I am not a great public speaker. I hate public speaking, so I always defer to Max to that. And if I need to know anything about Max, I defer to Tribal Rain, because she knows everything there is to know about Max. If I want to know where Max is, I don't ask Max, I ask Tribal Rain. She knows where Max is. <laughs> but a strong network is one in which each fiber is strong in its own right, right? So no matter where we are in this journey, whether it's organizing or we're just realizing that something needs to be done, we're all ever learning. And there's no one single ASNN campaign that's going to be able to end this fight. So whether we're successful in these five states or not, we still need to keep going. We need to keep going. We need to keep supporting each other. And that's how we're going to get it done in our moments of triumph and in our moments of defeat. Um, and there have been some, right? Like I said, we, we might not win the war, but we keep on, we live to fight another day. So, and in building relationships with people, we learn how to support each other best. We learn what questions to ask. I always ask people, no matter if it's in work or in personal relationships, how can I help you? That's how you get to know people. How can I help you? What do you need? I may not have what you need, but I may know who to ask or where to go get it. So just get in the habit of trying to be supportive to one another. This is very heavy work physically. It's very heavy financially. It's very heavy emotionally. And so again, like I'm so thankful to be in this space where we can convene together in community and think about what it looks like to support Vermont, what it looks like to support the other four states that are on the ballot, and what it looks like to support ASNN as a whole. Um, I want to close with a quote that Max actually gave me. Um, but before I do that, Max dragged me to ASNN. I just want to tell y'all, it's Max's fault that y'all have to deal with me. He told me, you got to do this. You got to do this. And I didn't even know. I was like, OK, I I'll try. And it actually turned out to be my life's work. So thank you, Max, for helping me realize that. I'm so appreciative of that. And thank you so, so much for being my mentor for the past year. Well, actually, it's been almost two years now. Um, I'm, I'm so appreciative for that. Um, and I also want to thank Vermont, first of all. Like, you guys rocked it this weekend. Like, you made us feel so much at home. Dr. Mark, Christine, and all of the Vermont Racial Alliance um, family, thank, thank you so much. It's a beautiful state, and I'm definitely gonna come back um, if I can, because um, I feel like I've made new friends and new family here. Um, so in closing, I just wanna say, uh, Frederick Douglass said, um, I expose slavery in this country because to expose it is to kill it. Slavery is one of those monsters of darkness to whom the light of truth is death. And I hold that the Abolish Slavery National Network is the light in the darkness on the pathway to liberation. And we are going to end slavery together. Yes. yes. Give it up for Savannah Eldridge, ASNN. Yes. They keep blaming me, it's not my fault. I ain't do none of that stuff they're talking about. I don't even know who this guy is they're talking about. I'm, yeah, I don't know. All right, we, we're gonna take it home. Uh, we're gonna have some comments from our host after this, but first, for one final poem, let's bring up this tribal oh. ring. full speed ahead. Not looking back, never looking back, so we didn't see the demons that were chasing us. See people, history, history is trying to erase us, trying to eradicate our genetic code from the book of life. But the melanin in our skin can't be wiped away with an eraser. The breath of life can't be redacted from our lungs. See you can't go back to Genesis and take back Adam's rib you've existed. She did. And she gave birth to nations. A black woman. What can I say? Black happened. And it can't be wiped off. It won't be wiped out. No matter how hard you try. 
No matter how deeply it may gall your pride, we won't be silenced by your genocides, by your quiet attempts to snuff us out. We won't be bound by the pitiful endeavors to enslave us, degrade us, or portray us as less than human. Because we are here, and here is where we remain. See, we stand tall despite our chains. And these trees transplanted onto our backs will not break no matter how many lashes you give. We'll implant our feet firmly into the soil, brace our backs to the winds, lift our eyes to the skies, firmly set our chins and shout, we stand. And the children that creep up from the cracks of our ancestral existence will be persistent and unyielding. We remain. From the moment Adam and Eve stepped forth from the Garden of Eden, our survival skills were honed and mastered, and we overcame. People, we overcome. Following the footsteps of Harriet, the torches of Nat, the battle cries of Malcolm, the prayers of Martin, and the bloody trails left by warriors with names that are too numerous to count. Black happened, and it's not a sin. It's not a curse. Savannah, it's not even a punishment. See, black is a gift of royalty. It is a mastery, a blessing. Black is what happened when God spoke and the world spun into existence. See, this moment right here, this right here is our living testimony. Because we are here, we stand strong, we remain, and black happened. Yes. Travel that rain one more time, everybody. All right. Yes. I'd like to bring up our host from Vermont, from Mark Hughes, to take us home. Thank you, everybody. God bless. There is um, a buzz in the room right now. But what I'm gonna ask everybody to do right now, because I know everybody's everybody's um, heading out. I see Feebo, I see you headed out the door, I see you hugging Curtis Davis, but I see I see Travel Ray hugging Isaac, but I see I see Mike looking at the food, I see Jorge hugging. But this is what I need, what I need y'all to do is to stop and come in. Bring it in. Focus. Bring it in because we're still together. We're not done yet. This is not over yet. Max, this is not over yet. Come in, please. Come in, tribal. This is not over yet. This is not how we end. This is not how we end. This is, how we end. This is we'll do the group photo later. But what we're gonna do right now is we're going to come together in spirit. Because that's what, we're, that's what we are. This right here, this will pass. Sure will. So if you can touch somebody, just reach out right now. Just reach out and touch somebody for a minute. Just for a minute, just touch. Even if you don't like them, just touch somebody for a minute. I don't care what faith you in right now. We, we gonna get serious for a minute. Hold it down. Hold it down, I'm not done yet. Stop talking. Stop talking. Stop talking. Father God, I thank you for these people. I thank you, Lord, for what, is, what it is that you're doing in the Abolished Slavery National Network. Lord God, I pray that you would protect everybody as you return them to their destinations. And I pray that you would have your hand over this work because it stands for truth and it stands for justice and it stands for you, Lord. It is what you represent, Lord. It is a sense of right. You said, Lord, that we would, if we would just do justice and love mercy, Lord, that you would be with us. So now, God, we ask that you walk with us in this fight. God, we know that the adversary is forever busy, Lord, and he never stops. So now, God, we pray that you take us all home safely and that you keep us engaged in the battle, Lord. We thank you for your power. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. And we thank you for winning, Lord, because you are God and you are God of all. Thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. It is our duty to love and care for one another. We have nothing to lose but our chains. Yes. Amen. I want to say thank you to Gina. You can
take us home now, bro. We're done. See you guys when we get back. Please, you gotta take a picture. Oh, we gotta take a picture. We don't need them to see that.